Let's pray for Joanne. She's uh, she's been a lot of pain lately. Had a headache for a couple months now, and it looked like she was holding her jaw. So let's let's pray for her and, and for the kids and, and for our study this morning. So uh, please join with me in prayer. <clears throat> Lord, we just uh, we do want to come and lift up Joanne to you and and ask that you would just touch her her head, the the pain that she's going through, and, and her jaw. And, would you just comfort her? Lord, you can just take away whatever's causing this this pain, the headache, and the, and the jaw. So, would you just do that? Would you just touch and, and heal and, and be with her? Anoint her afresh, even in the midst of the pain, to, to share with the children what you have for them today. And just anoint the message and, and bless it, their time together. And, uh, and, and let them be attentive. Let them receive from their heart, um, by your spirit, what you have for them and protect that work you're doing again. And Lord, I lift up this study here, uh, the message that you have for us today, and, and that you would anoint me afresh to share by your Spirit what you have for your your people today. And so just be with us, Lord, and, and you be glorified. You get all the glory and the praise and the honor that, that is due you. So thank you, Lord, for this day. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, on this uh, Mother's Day... Um, I titled today's message, uh, Listen to Your Mother. Okay? Um, you've heard or maybe you remember uh, that phrase, do what your mother says. Or, like today's title, Listen to Your Mother. So on this Mother's Day, I want us to, I want to look at a mother in the Bible, a very special lady in the Bible. And that's uh, Mary. We're going to look at Mary, the mother of Jesus. So if you want to turn in your Bibles to John chapter 2, uh, we'll get started. John chapter 2, and we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 5 and, and many others. Mothers put up with so much, uh, so much heartache. John chapter 2. Mothers put up with so much, so much heartache, um, so much disappointment, so much joy and uh, fulfillment in being a mother. And, and now some of you grandmothers, right? The disappointments, the heartaches, and, and the, the struggles, a lot of times those come from uh, you know, men in their lives because uh, we sometimes lack... Uh, the tender, loving understanding that women require as they pour out so much of themselves to the children, to the family, right? To nurture it, to take care of it. Um, mothers are always on the job 24-7. Never hardly getting a break, okay? It's not a 9-to-5, it, it's 24-7. And... Uh, God has really made woman a special, special creation and nurturing heart and love and care that just men, men just don't have. You know? um, it was taken out of us, right? Out of the side and, and given to, to them. And it's, it's very special. And, and we want to honor them. We want to honor you today and, and thank you for who you are, who God has made you. It's, it's very draining. And, and women don't get the praise and support they deserve for all they do. I had a very special mother growing up. Very special, like I just described, mother growing up. Whose name was also Mary, mother of Tim. And my sons can say the same thing about their mother. As my mother was to me, very nurturing, very caring, very loving, very gentle and kind. Uh, my wife is that way in our family, to our boys, and they love her dearly. She's so very special to us. I don't know if your mother was that way or not. Only you know that. And sometimes it's not the case. But Mary, the mother of Jesus, was a very special girl. The Bible makes that very clear. She was very special. And she found favor with God. 
before we get started, um, we need to look back in order to understand more fully what's going on in our scriptures that we're going to look at today. So I want to give you a little background with Mary, okay? Now you don't need to turn there unless you want to, but I've given the scriptures we're going to be looking at on your outline. In Luke chapter 1, verse 26 through 35, it tells us that in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth. So the reason it says in the sixth month, just prior to that, that same angel Gabriel came to Zechariah in the temple. He was burning incense. And they had been praying for a child, him and his wife Elizabeth. And she was barren and way past the time of childbirth. But the, the angel Gabriel came to Zechariah and said, it's been answered, right? God answers our prayer in His timing. And He came and says, your wife Elizabeth is going to get pregnant and give birth to the forerunner, the one who's going to make the way of the Messiah. And the Old Testament prophesies this. And so in the sixth month of her pregnancy, Gabriel then comes to Mary in Nazareth. Okay? So that's why uh, it says that. Verse 27, Luke chapter 1, verse 27. The angel Gabriel came to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph. Okay, so she's a virgin. She hasn't had sexual relations yet, but she's engaged to Joseph to be married. Okay? And Joseph is of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. Now, Mary is also of the house of David. So both of them are of the house of David. As was prophesied that the Messiah would come from the line of David. Okay. Now look at this on your outline. Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14 says this. That now this is written 700 years before this in, in Luke chapter uh, one takes place. 700 years before Gabriel comes to Mary the Virgin. In, in Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14 it says, Therefore the Lord Himself will give you a sign. Behold, the Virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call His name Emmanuel. The first song we sung, we sang today, Emmanuel. What does it mean? It means God with us. It also could mean God uh, or with us is God. So, God with us or with us is God. Okay? And that's who Jesus is. Symbolic and prophetic name of the Messiah, the Christ, prophesying that in the book of Isaiah that He would be born of a virgin and would be God with us. Okay? And this is what Gabriel came to Mary and began, began to proclaim to her. Verse 28 in Luke. Chapter 1. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one. Right? She found favor in, in the, the sight of the Lord. The Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid. Wouldn't you be afraid if an angel all of a sudden appeared to you? You'd be frightened. So every time we see angels appearing to men, they always say that same thing. Don't be afraid. Right? So don't be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. 31, verse 31, And behold, you will conceive in your womb. Okay? Very particular word. You will conceive in your womb. That means her egg was going to be fertilized by the Holy Spirit. Okay? She wasn't going to have uh, sexual relations with God, but the Holy Spirit was going to fertilize the egg. She was going to conceive the child okay very clear in scripture and bear a son so you're going to conceive and bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus now in Hebrew it's Yehoshua Yehoshua in, in Greek it's Jesus but in Hebrew it's Yehoshua okay and it means Yahweh is salvation okay Yahweh, that those consonants, is it the consonants? Yeah, 
the consonants Y-H-W-H that have been interpreted as Jehovah, okay? It's Yahweh. It's that covenant name in the Old Testament for the Lord, okay? Yahweh, for God. Yahweh is salvation. Verse 32. He will be great, and He will be called the Son of the Most High. Who is the Most High? God. He's going to be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give Him the throne of His father David. You see right there. Um, David wanted to build a temple. And Nathan said, Hey, whatever's on your heart, go ahead and do. The prophet um, Nathan. And so that night the Lord came to Nathan and said, No, go back. You spoke too soon. David's not going to build me a house. He has blood on his hands. Now, whether that means uh, because he was a uh, uh, all the the battles that he fought, and or, or maybe it was Bathsheba and Uriah. Maybe it was that incident. But in, anyway, God said, David, you're not going to build me a house. Your son Solomon's going to do it, and that's why it's called Solomon's Temple. And yet, David didn't just sit and rest. He prepared. He gathered all the spoils of war and, and prepared them, laid them aside for Solomon to build the temple. Okay, So really David gets credit for, for that as well. But also a prophecy, prophecy was given to David that from his seed would come one that would sit on God's throne forever. Right, And so David marveled at that, that the Messiah was going to come from his, his line. Okay? And this is what Gabriel is saying. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father, David. Okay? Now, David wasn't his father, obviously. God was his father. Verse 33. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom there, uh, there will be no end. Verse 34. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. This is how it happened. And the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. Now, this is what many false religions don't understand. The Bible makes it very clear. Very clear. That Jesus was already existent. He was already God. Okay? but became also a man through a miraculous birth by the Virgin Mary, by the Holy Spirit. So God becomes a man so that He could live a, a life and fulfill the commandments. Right? The first Adam, Paul talks about this, the first Adam sinned and blew it and through one man sin entered the human race. Okay? And then the second Adam comes on the scene. And he fulfills the law and goes to the cross and redeems us. He, he sheds his blood for us. He dies for us. So the virgin conceived by the Holy Spirit. Jesus is God in the flesh. God with us. Okay? John chapter 1 verse 1 says this In the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God It's not talking about God It's talking about the Word this, this thing they're calling the Word In the beginning was the Word The Word was with God and the Word was God There's more than one person we're talking about here Revelation 19.13, speaking of Christ at His second coming, after the tribulation period and the battle of Armageddon, Jesus, we, they're going to look up and see Him coming on the clouds of heaven. And it says this in Revelation 19.13, it says, He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which He is called is the Word of God. Right? In the beginning was the Word. Right? So this is Jesus that's being talked about here. And when you study it in the Greek, it makes it so clear. Okay? In the Greek, all the attributes, everything that points to God's character and His attributes, who He is, 
All those attributes in the Greek in John chapter 1 verse 1 point to the Word, to Jesus, who He is, that He is God. Not that He was a God or that He became a God, but that He was God in the beginning and that He became a man and dwelt among us. Verse 2 says, He was in the beginning with God and all things were made through Him, through this person that they're talking about, the Word. So all things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Okay, that's interesting. Right? Now Colossians chapter 1 verse 16 on your outline. Down towards the middle. It says, For by Him, this person we're talking about, all things were created in heaven, on earth, visible, invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through Him, and for Him. So whoever is being talked about there, everything was created through Him and for Him. Now look what Hebrews chapter 1 says. Verse 2. But in these last days, He, God, has spoken to us by who? His Son, whom He appointed the heir of all things, through whom also He created the world. So, Clearly, Jesus is the one, the second person of the Trinity. In the beginning, in the book of Genesis, it says, and in the beginning, God, and the Hebrew word for God is Elohim. Okay? It's a plural noun that means three or more. In the beginning, Elohim, three or more, created the heavens and the earth. Well, we just found out who that was who did that who spoke it into existence. Jesus, the second person of the Trinity. Very very fascinating. So Scripture makes it oh so clear that Jesus is God, that He always existed with the Father, that Jesus was, uh, was the one who spoke everything into existence in Genesis chapter 1, and that through the Holy Spirit became a man by the prophesied virgin birth in Isaiah that we looked at already. Now John chapter 1 verse 14 just clarifies it again. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us and we have seen His glory. The glory as of the only Son from the Father full of grace and truth. Amen? Okay, now fast forward, okay, 30 years after Jesus was born and he grew up, after he was baptized in the Jordan by John the Baptist. I think he was the first Southern Baptist there down in the southern part of the Jordan. Who, speaking of Jesus, when Jesus was approaching the Jordan River, John's down there baptizing, and here comes Jesus. And John says this, prophetically, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Right? And then after picking picking most of his disciples, he goes to a wedding in Cana. Not Lincoln City, where we were, but in Cana. He goes to a wedding. And in John chapter 2, verse 1, we finally arrived at our verses. It says, On the third day there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee. And the mother of Jesus was there. Now in in Jesus' day, Jewish wedding celebrations lasted for one week. During which time relatives and friends and everybody would stay in the home of the bride and the groom sort of a honeymoon, family reunion, bachelor party, wedding shower, all kind of rolled into one week. And during the seven day celebration, the bride would be tucked away in the bridal chamber. And the only person that would get to see the bride was the groom until the end of the feast. And then she would be brought out in a great celebration. And all that is a picture of what's coming. Because you see, the groom is coming for his bride. 
And we are His bride, the church. And the groom is going to come and He's going to take His bride and He's going to tuck His bride away for not seven days, but seven years during the tribulation period. We're going to be tucked away. And at the end of it, He's going to present His bride to the world. And there's going to be a celebration, a feast. The marriage supper of the Lamb will take place. So, verse 2, John chapter 2, verse 2. Jesus also was invited to the wedding with His disciples. Okay? Now, Jesus' presence at this particular wedding signals His stamp of approval upon all aspects of the institution of marriage. Civil, legal, and religious. A wedding ceremony itself has an effect that is not often understood. Couples find a commitment made to each other in a public ceremony harder to break when the going gets tough. Here in John chapter 2, at the very outset of His public ministry, Jesus honored and elevated the institution of marriage. And Paul takes this in his book, in his epistle, and he says, it's a picture, okay? Marriage is a picture of Christ and the church. It's a picture of that. And so it's very special, very holy, and instituted by God. John chapter 2, verse 3. Now when the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And in our case, it was a good thing at our way. Cut it off. Now, Mary turned to her son for help. However, based on the following response that Jesus gave to her, it's my personal uh, conviction that Mary was interested in more than the simple provision of wine. Remember Mary at 14 or 15, the angel came to her and said, Hey, you're going you're gonna to conceive and bear a son. Right? You're a virgin. You're not married yet. And she's going to be pregnant. Okay? She's going to be the talk of the town, right? The slander. And all the stuff that she went through. And Scripture doesn't tell us that she told anybody. Joseph, her husband, was going to... But the angel came to Joseph and said, No, it's of the Holy Spirit. But the, the, imagine what she went through. right? And here's 30 years later, and man, I want some vindication. I've been waiting for you to be revealed for who you are. In John chapter 841, I didn't give it to you, but John chapter 841, defending their own righteousness, right? The Pharisees said this to Jesus. We were not born of fornication. Okay, this is 30 years later. Okay? So that was the talk. That was the implication that he was born of fornication. Right? So imagine the pain, the suffering. Uh, the character defamation that Mary went through. For 30 years, Mary had lived with the knowledge that her character had been unjustly tainted, slandered. Is it not possible that at this point she looked to her son not only for wine but for vindication? Okay? All the families there, all the friends, all the people. Right? And oftentimes that can be the case. We can uh, pray for deliverance, pray for vindication, pray for things more. More in a, I mean, it might sound righteous, right? But sometimes it's it's for, for self-preservation. Verse four, Jesus said to her, "Woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come." So his answer there shows us that. There's a little more involved here than just 
we ran out of wine, right? Now the hour, my hour has not yet come. The hour is the time of the irrefutable declaration of who he was. Okay, that had to come at the exact moment in time prophesied by Daniel. Saint Gabriel came to Daniel back in Babylon. Daniel was praying. Daniel gets a prophecy of the coming of the Messiah. 483 years after a decree to rebuild the walls around Jerusalem. And that day was fulfilled exactly to the day when Jesus rode in on the donkey on the triumphal entry. That was the hour that He would be revealed for who He is. So He says to His mother, My hour has not yet come. The hour is also when His earthly ministry would be finished. Shortly after that triumphal entry, He would be crucified. Right? He would go in and cleanse the temple one last time. He did it at the beginning of His ministry, and He does it at the end of His ministry. And that very act right there was one of the steps that got Him betrayed and, and killed. For a purpose. God planned it from the beginning. Amazing when you look at it, when you think about it, the One who created the, the earth and the universe and us created it in order to have a relationship with us knowing that He was going to pay an ultimate price for us. Right? So He says, Woman, right? speaking to Mary, His mother, I better than anyone know you have been waiting patiently. Have you been waiting patiently? I know better than anyone how you have been hurt. I understand better than anyone your situation. But it's not time to rectify everything. Not quite yet. It's always God's perfect time when He does something, when He acts. What does this say to us? Oftentimes we ask the Lord to do something that will get us off the hook or, or make us a, look a little better. We ask Him to do something that will smooth our road or lighten our load. And like Mary, our requests might sound very noble, very generous, very um, others-centered. But in reality, a lot of times they're self-centered. And in such instances, Jesus might whisper in our hearts, as He did to Mary, what does this have to do with me? This is not the hour. This is not the time. This is not the place. The problem will be solved. Your reputation will be salvaged. The provision will be made. The healing will come. My hour has not yet come. In the book of Daniel, Daniel was taken captive into Babylon by Nebuchadnezzar. And after interpreting a dream, much like Joseph did, right, Daniel was elevated to a high level of position. But then, later on, when Daniel was 65 years old, Nebuchadnezzar came into power and Daniel was removed from office. And for 20 years, Daniel is not seen in the narrative of the book that he wrote. For 20 years. But then the day came that Belshazzar called for him to interpret the mysterious handwriting on the wall. Many, many Tekli Farsim. And so, when Darius the Mede seized control of the kingdom shortly after that, Daniel was placed in a position of prominence once again. And so for 20 years, Daniel was neither used in ministry or given a position of responsibility. And yet Daniel, being a man of integrity, he did what we must do. He remained ready. He didn't say, I've been walking with the Lord for 5 years or 10 years or 20 and nothing's happening. 
it is our job and my job and your job to be ready to walk with the Lord to spend time in the presence of the Lord and to learn about the Lord so that when Belshazzar comes and says to us what does this mean? we're ready we're able to give a defense we're able to answer the questions right? we'll be ready so then we can like Daniel we can say I can tell you because for 20 years I've been in touch with God for 20 years I've been in a place of prayer for 20 years I've been close to the Lord and that's what we need to do are you in prayer? are you studying the word? are you loving the Lord? are you ready? in a certain moment your hour will come and God will have a divine appointment for you to bring somebody into the kingdom will you be ready for it? and their soul will depend on your response to their questions <coughs> and we need to be ready your time will arrive a significant task a life-changing opportunity will arise and then it will be too late to prepare. We need to prepare ahead of time. Coming down the mountain of transfiguration, uh, Jesus took up three disciples with him, Peter, James, and John. And the other nine were down below waiting. And when Jesus came to them, uh, there was a man whose son had a demon. Had, he was a... a Paralytic, how do you say it? Paralytic? That's the right way to say it. Huh? Something. Paralytic. Not that all paralytics have demon possession, but this one did. And his disciples couldn't deliver him from the demon. And Jesus cast him out. And they said, well, Why couldn't we do this? And he said, This type, this type of, of demonic possession requires prayer and fasting. Now, that meant that they needed to be, he was giving us a word of advice, we need to be in prayer and fasting because we never know when the opportunity, when it comes, if we're not prepared, it will be too late to prepare. And that's why they were unable to do it. Right? And this is what it's talking about here. So too, <clears throat> there are those today who say, the Lord never uses me. The church never calls on me. But when the opportunity arises before them, they will either be unable to meet it or completely unaware of it. So our responsibility, because we're all in ministry as a believer, is to be ready and then to rest. Rest. Rest in the Lord. Study the scripture in the place of intimacy and prayer. Worship the Lord. Get to know Him all the more. And then rest. Saying, Lord, when the hour comes in which you want to use me to do something for your glory, I'm ready. Now this is what his mother says to Jesus' response. John chapter 2 verse 5. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Do whatever he tells you. So if you won't listen to your mother, which you should, listen to your mother. Listen to Jesus' mother and her advice to us. You know, these are the last recorded words of Mary in the Bible. And who does she point to? Her son. Whatever he tells you to do, do it. Now Jesus just told us in John chapter 2 that my hour has not yet come. But now, go three years past this point. 
at the end of his ministry. This is at the beginning of his ministry. Three years later, in Luke chapter 22, in an upper room in Jerusalem, Jesus speaks to his disciples and tells them what to do because his hour has come. Luke 22, 14. We're almost done. And when the hour came, he reclined at the table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and he gave it to them saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So he's telling them what to do. And likewise, the cup, after they had eaten, saying, This is the cup that is poured out for you, is the new covenant in my blood. So, the one who was always existing with the Father, the second person of the Trinity, spoke into existence. He becomes a man. God becomes a man so that He can go and pour out His blood for us for forgiveness at the cross Jesus said it is finished okay? it's done to tell us that it's completed it's, it's finished and he gave up his spirit and the guard came there was two other men hanging and they were still alive and the Pharisees didn't want him them still hanging on the cross on their feast of Passover and the Passover, as you know, was the day the Jews would celebrate the killing of the Lamb, which delivered them from the death angel back in Egypt, right? The Passover Lamb. Remember John said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away... So Jesus is killed on Passover, the exact day. The substitution for us, right there, hanging on the cross. But He said, It is finished, and He gave up the Spirit. And the soldiers came to break the legs of, the, of, of all three of them. And so they broke the legs of the two uh, criminals on each side because they were still alive. And when you break the legs of someone on the cross, they could no longer lift themselves up to take that breath. And then they would settle back down in agonizing pain. So they would break the, the knees. They would break the legs. And they came to Jesus and He was already dead. So He took a spear and He shoved it in the side. And out comes blood and water. Right? Wash me in the water. Right? Wash me in the blood. And so blood mixed with water comes out the side. And it reminds you of Adam. Remember? Adam, God put Adam to sleep and out of his side, what did He do? He took Eve, the bride. Right? And so out of the side of our Savior, on the cross, comes the birthing elements. Right? The birthing liquids, water. The water breaks and the child comes forth and blood comes forth. So out of his side comes the blood that allows us. What did Jesus say? You must be born again. Right? We have to be born again. You have to be born of water and you need to be born of the Spirit for you to enter into my kingdom. My blood needs to wash you and take your sin away. You must be born again of the Spirit. And that's how we enter into fellowship with God through the cross by the shedding of His blood poured out for us. And we just receive that. Because Jesus is God. And God became a man so that He could die in our place because the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. Amen? Lord, thank You for Your Word. Thank You for this amazing Word that You gave us through the prophets, through the apostles, through the, the men You chose and filled with Your Spirit to give us Your Word. 
God breathed. So Lord, thank you for your your word to us, your instruction for us, and uh, your instruction for us today. So Lord, I just pray you would seal it in the hearts and the minds of your people here today, and that the enemy wouldn't steal it away. So Lord, thank you for what you're doing and what you've, you've said to us today in Jesus' name. Amen.